गुड इवनिंग डेलीगेट्स एंड पार्टिसिपेंट्स थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग शील कनेक्ट एंड टुडे वी आर बैक विद द फेमस एकेडमिक प्रोग्राम व्हिच इज ऑर्गेनाइज्ड बाय डॉक्टर वर्षा बस्ते एंड दिस इज द सीरीज फॉक्सी आईएईसी कमिटी हु प्रेजेंट्स अ वेबिनार ऑन द टॉपिक ऑल अबाउट एम्नियोटिक फ्लूइड विद वेस्ट जोन महाराष्ट्र टीम सो uh before we start with this uh, program let me introduce our moc for today's uh, session so we have three mocs for today's uh, session dr rashmi kahar uh, dr ashwini kale and dr monika umbardant so let me introduce uh, everyone dr rashmi uh, karodkar kahar ma'am is a consultant obgy in amravati maharashtra ma'am is chairperson of AM OGS a high risk pregnancy committee ma'am is also organizing secretary and uh, ma'am is uh, best zone Nishan. coordinator of Foxy Nishan. yes ma'am okay Nishan now Nishan. Uh, let me also, okay so let me also introduce uh, uh, other moc uh, saidi yeah so dr ashwini kale ma'am is ivf consultant and chief embryologist in asha kiran hospital and asha ivf center and ma'am is general that will be okay you can PLGS go 20. ahead with the next oh. one yeah yeah, yeah ma'am and uh, our last moc uh, dr monica uh, mm-hmm. saithi yeah. so dr monica umardan ma'am uh, is consultant uh, obstetrician gynecologist in mangalya nursing atharva uh, fertility center and ma'am is a okay. back chairperson of 2020 Let it be, let it be. So I hand over the session to our MOC for. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Ma'am. So I hand over the session. Thank you so much, everyone. म्यूट डॉक्टर अश्विनी अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ मोनिका प्लीज चेक हेलो Uh, the convener for today's program is Dr. Varsha Basu, madam. She is currently the chairperson of the Proxy IAEC committee. We welcome you, ma'am. Uh, she is a practicing gynecologist in Nashik for the last thirty years, and she is also the director at Basu Maternity Hospital and Pushpa Fertility Center. She is also the CEO and founder of the Cell Gen Anti Aging Stem Cell Center. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, yes. The coordinators for today's program are Dr. Pratibha Singh. She is a national coordinator for the International Exchange of Academic Exchange Committee, and Dr. Shashi Bala Ghosle. She is also the coordinator for this program. Dr. Pratibha Singh is a consultant and laparoscopic gynecologist and IVF specialist, uh, working at Bagalpur. She is also the national coordinator for IEAC Foxy Twenty One Twenty Two. Can we have the next video, please? Dr. Shashi Bala Bhosle uh, is the president of Gwalior OBGYN Society 2223. She has been practicing since it's last okay. 1980. Yes, that's ma'am. enough. Can enough we have the me. next? Yes, yes. Can we have the next? The next TV, please. We welcome our chief guest, uh, esteemed chief guest for today's evening, Dr. Shanta Kumari, madam. She is the president of Foxy for 21, 22, as well as she is the treasurer of Tigo. She is a senior consultant and laparoscopic surgeon at Yashoda Hospital, Hyderabad. She is also served as a Tigo member of the Committee of Human Rights. 
feeling proud to be a part of this webinar on amniotic fluid it's a really a practical one which will cover all aspects of amniotic fluid program for am so you can talk very clear such a practical webinar for day to day practice because amniotic fluid is really important in our practice with the galaxy of people like dr murlidhar pai dr jayam kannan dr girija wag dr surekha taide vaste dr ashwini kale and panelists and chairs it's a great event and of course with the you know, dr ashwini kale dr dr monika ubardant will add to the flavor i wish every success to dr varsha vaste and dr shashi wala i wish every success to this webinar thank you thank you so much for inviting me thank you thank you sir thank you uh, i welcome all the dignitaries uh, web, uh, for the webinar uh, the guest of honor dr sanjay gupte sir dr uh, uh, parikshit tang and our chief guest dr rajendra singh pardeshi is so humble and always helpful and always ready to participate he is so busy in participating in all webinars but he doesn't say no to anybody and he is the really uh, the king of uh, among uh, we will say and we follow his instructions thank you sir thank you for we are really obliged for having dr rajendra singh pardeshi sir and also our uh, guest of honor dr um, sanjay gupte sir and dr uh, uh, president elect dr jaydeep tang thank you thank you for coming over here and gracing the occasion and our star wars speakers dr jm kanan madam dr surekha taide dr murlidhar pai and dr girija wag all are so stalwart and people love to attend their um, uh, talks and they are they really prepare specially for this webinar their the, uh, recent updates and they really pour their heart and soul to give the best of everything to the audience that's why we have good number of um, uh, people uh, audience who like to join this webinars foxy international academic exchange committee webinars are for the general practicing foxy foxians and we have, so far we have covered all all zones of um, india north east and south and all zones even madhya pradesh and now welcome dr murli darpai you can unmute yourself and uh, all all these uh, but, but the west zone is bigger so we have covered with three webinars in west zone and we have covered almost all the um, subjects which are essential for the practicing gynecologist who can do practice through their opds and listen to our webinar and they can get good updates from these stalwarts so i welcome all you and i hand over the proceedings to dr monika and the mc uh, just a minute dr varsha uh, we would like to welcome our guest of honor dr jaydeep tank is here of course, of and course. may i have uh, i just yes. saw him he's joined and uh, may i have his uh, have the pleasure of reading his cv sir dr jaydeep tank is president elect foxy he has been secretary general federation of ob gynae i have been doing so much we have worked with him and he has project led uh, foxy usaid projects 2020 to 2024 and is in past president mumbai ob gynae he is deputy secretary asia oceana federation of obstetrics and gynae he has been immediate past chair international federation for safe abortion and has been past chair publication newsletter committee afog 
past chair reproductive endocrinology and infertility committee fog and is in past chair mtp committee we have seen so many amendments going on and thanks to him and he has been awarded the frcog honors for the in 2020 by the royal college of obstetricians and gynecologists it's be conferred and his consultant ashwini maternity and surgical hospital so he's risen from their center for endoscopy and ivf and he's co-founder esperanza healthcare private limited welcome sir may i have a few words of blessings from you sure hey, deep thanks sir but i think gupte sir should speak first if he is not yeah uh, dr ashwini uh, dr ashwini please introduce our guest of honor our senior yes. host dr gupte sir please it's definitely a proud privilege and honor for me ashwini ashwini let's uh, skip the uh, dr gupte introduction you know i think obviously needs no introduction very important uh, webinar and i congratulate dr varsha and her team and i thank uh, also um, dr jaydeep for <laughs> actually you know you are the president elect foxy now so you are supposed to take the lead now okay <laughs> yeah. anyway this amniotic fluid is a really an amazing uh, fluid as such in our body from the cilomic cavity for first 8 weeks then we have this amniotic cavity after 8 weeks and everything that you want to know about the baby and a lot of things about the mother one can really make out from the amniotic fluid you know the uh, the progress of the baby well being of the baby genetics of the baby you name it and everything you know you can get it from uh, you know the uh, this amniotic fluid and i'm sure we have stalwarts like jam and you know amurlidhar and you know, and we are eager to listen to them so i'll not you know take too much of your time and please go ahead with jaydeep stock and jaydeep's blessings and you know the talks thank you thank you sir thank you for uh, gracing the occasion thank you so much <clears throat> thank you sir uh, i'll i'll go ahead since i've already been introduced uh, let me begin first by uh, thanking and acknowledging the president of foxy dr shanta kumari the secretary general and the vice president dr bipin pandit who is in charge of the iaec committee and of course Uh, someone whom i regard as a very very close friend guide and mentor dr rajendra singh pardesi sir always a pleasure to see you sir uh, thank you gupte sir uh, for uh, going ahead i i think i know gupte sir since the time my father got installed in pune in 1997 and uh, sir is always someone i think not only me but all of us in foxy look up to and turn to whenever there is any difficult situation and he always comes always with the right answer the correct answer and uh, you know it's always such a pleasure to meet him and uh, hear him and, and and speak with him uh, let me congratulate varsha the chairperson of the foxy iic committee thank you iic committee has always been one of our very vibrant and very active committees and varsha your work during covid uh, was really very much appreciated by everybody uh, and i'm sure that you will work much more in your uh, further capacities uh, within foxy and outside foxy uh, let me also thank dr sashibala madam for that wonderful very kind warm and very generous uh, introduction and the coordinator dr pratibha singh and the master of ceremonies dr rashmi dr ashwini and monica uh, i think this topic for today is of course extremely important as gupte sir has already said uh, starting from you know the very early part of uh, embryonic life right up to the end i have always considered uh, like a an amniotic fluid as one of the most important markers of fetal health in fact whenever i get a ultrasound report saying growth retardation or less growth or sga but if the fluid is fine i'm usually quite reassured the minute the fluid starts dipping or it starts increasing uh, one way or another i really get uh, quite worried and i know that i should be taking some action now and of course you've got such brilliant speakers jayam kanan madam it's such a pleasure to see you madam it's been a while since i have met madam and it's always such a wonderful pleasure to see her dr murlidhar bhai I always say when Dr. Murlidhar Pai is in a webinar that accounts for at least a twenty percent rise in attendance. 
<laughs> absolutely absolutely and of course my dear old friend girija i'm looking forward to working with her uh, in when i take over because she will be my vice president that i not only look forward to working i'm also looking for good guidance from her through the year and of course surekha whom we all know is such a brilliant academician and will be uh, playing a very active role in foxy over the years you also selected wonderful chairpersons dr anjali dr preeti dr anjali bare dr rajendra chauhan dr anuradha dr nirupamma dr priya and dr vaishali and i'm very happy that uh, you have a panel on managing amniotic fluid index which i'm sure will cover the basics of measuring the significance when it increases when it decreases and so on and that's going to be moderated by you and ashwini with some wonderful panelists again manisha priya dr nasreen dr jaya dr seema dr meenal and sangeetha so with those few words i'm going to step out of your way i'm going to step out of the audience's way and hope that you will have a wonderful webinar which i'm sure it will be thank you very much again varsha thank you thank you jaydeep thank you jaydeep and thank you all the dignitaries for your love and affection for us Um, you you acknowledge your presence and grace the occasion thank you thank you everybody we are really obliged over to your emotions yeah we will now begin with our first session i would like to introduce our chairpersons for the first session dr anjali jama madam can i have a cv slide please yeah she is currently the president of solapur op she was previously the secretary of solapur obgy society and also the treasurer and organizing secretary for two zonal conferences and she has been invited for many national and state level conferences the next cv please dr priti deshpande madam she is currently the president of karad obgy society and director of ekopa hospital and karad fertility center she has received many awards like the indumati zaveri prize for best research at aicog and she's been the author of various articles in national and international journals i now request our chairpersons to please introduce the speaker dr jayam kannan for kind attention ma'am i take this privilege to thank you uh, all the dignitaries padeshi sir varsha madam gupte sir thank sir and uh, iic committee really proud to be part of this important Uh, webinar but a neglected topic today we have distinguished speakers madam jayam kanan madam she received best committee award foxy adolescent health committee in 2013 and 15 she is a managing trustee of uh, garbha rakshagi group char sama make it short yeah uh, she is a director of gfc uh, fertility center trichy and chennai she work as a vice president of foxy in 2018 since 1992 she is a president uh, free legal aid center for uh, women at trichy she had many prestigious awards uh, to her credit and written a book uh, and delivered many talks in the conferences thank you madam over thank to you, you. thank you can i be allowed to share my screen yes madam yes please yes yes yes, yes. thank you madam thank you thank you is my this thing coming in the screen not yet no, not yet madam. i am not allowed to share my screen please allow me to share my screen shall i speak to you please look into it yes uh, you can start sharing ma'am um, no my share screen share screen doesn't show yes ma'am now it's coming ma'am now it's is it coming yes ma'am yes, ma yes so to my sweet varsha baste to whom i love a lot thank you so and, much madam uh, uh, the same wonderful times i had with you wish you a <laughs> great you. journey ahead thank you ma'am like this liker which has started its journey even before we find urine test positive we say at 18 8 weeks 15 ml but i have at least 
By four weeks, it has been two ml, three ml. Who has detected it? We are not able to detect it. That is why we say at eight weeks it is fifteen ml, and at seventeen weeks jumps to two fifty. When it comes to twenty weeks, four hundred ml. That is the time we are able to measure it properly, which increases day after it comes down. And when we call severe oligos, when it is two hundred ml at term, and it is defined as low. Like uh, when the maximum vertical pool is less than two centimeter, when AFI is less than five, and in the present scenario everything is being talked in the centile, when it is at any gestational peak below the fifth centile, it is so. Now let us move on the journey from our fertilization down to it. See, we all know that in the cell mass everything is being formed by day six, seven of the fetus itself. Then by day eight itself, it starts dividing into AP blast and hypoblast. And in between the AP blast and hypoblast is the where the inner cell mass develops into ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. Just above it is the cavity of the amnion to be formed. Below that, the yellow line is the one which forms the yolk sac, which gives rise to later on. So by day eight itself, you can see a small cavity which is formed. At that time, nobody knows you are pregnant. By day nine, it quickly moves towards a cranial end and starts forming that uh, cavity amnion. So where who provides water to this amniotic cavity? It is the intercellular fluid from the maternal system, the somites giving to the cells, and also the lateral plate from which diffusion of this young. It is all only purely fluid at this time. By the time there is a fight between the amniotic cavity and yolk sac, who is to nurture the this inner cell mass, which is coming as ecto, endo, and mesoderm. At that time, initially, the yolk sac takes over and nurtures the baby very nicely by up to day 16 to 18 day after fertilization. It goes up to 10 weeks. But however, Soon, the yolk sac is put into sleep and the amniotic cavity takes over and it sucks the baby inside the amniotic cavity. Automatically, the yolk sac is forced to follow into that and fall into the depth and it gets disconnected. The baby has to accept the vanishing of the yolk sac and allow the amniotic cavity to go up. So when the baby allows this thing go up, how the circulation comes, initially it is the amnion, chorion, and the placenta, and other system which are giving the fluid. Later on, it is the urine of the baby which is coming out, getting swallowed back by the baby, along with that, some lung fluid also comes out. When we say measure of the amniotic fluid, we have already said AFI and MP. Why we are worried so much about oligohydramnias? Because it is an indicator of birth defects, very, very high medical legal problem. And it in, in indicates three important things. One is utero-placental insufficiency, fetal urine tract and urine production problem, and pulmonary hyperplasia giving rise to perinatal morbidity and on the other side, it also is a cause for miscarriage, preterm birth, very badly the still the birth. And now the fetal origin of adult diseases is also included in that. The AFI is evaluated, everybody knows, with the mother's four quadrant, the largest vertical packet. And anything five is below is CP oligogatamias. Six to eight is okay. Eight to 24 is normal. 24 plus is polyhydramnias about with my next speaker, Murlidhar, is waiting to bombard. Okay. <laughs> this is the centile values. Please see the centile value starts only at the 16th week. But I said the amniotic cavity is formed at the eighth day of the in utero life itself. You see this? This is the fifth centile. This is the 95th centile. And this centile is the one which is going to be charted now in the present. And this very heavily, kindly note it is Cunningham from the Williams Oxford book, which I have taken 22nd edition. Now the present edition is 26. About 10 years ago, it was published. And the same thing gets maintained and now also. The incidence of Loligahedramnes is 4% even with a normal baby. 
but this oligohydramnios of this 4% is sometimes overdiagnosed, especially when you are using the amniotic fluid intakes. However, D particle packet is going to be the best order as per the SMFF foundation. It, as everybody knows, it is always the fetus, mother, placenta, and other things. In the fetus, we know the birth defects. In maternal, this thing, it is one thing we have to be very clear. It is the toxemia of pregnancy. And automatically in the placenta, it comes to be the intrinsic TTS syndrome. And then slow abruption of the placenta is also caused for oligohydramnias and drugs which we are given and has reduced also. So now having defined what is oligohydramnias, Define the etiology. Is the patient having a some leak now and then, which is reducing the liker? Is she having an anomaly? Target, do a target scan. There is a medical legal case in which a radiologist has argued that he has done only a 20 week scan and he has not done a target scan. But the judge did not accept that at 20 weeks he should have done a fetal abnormality also and he has been given the negligent sentence also. And always rule out, if there is no leak, think of an intrauterine growth restriction where the baby is not able to swallow, it is not able to pass urine also. And in all of these cases, think whether you can do an amniocentesis and also be cautious to test for APLA also. Now, having said oligohydramnet is always the ultrasound. So the ultrasound, how we are going to keep it? Are you going to have the maximum area that is noted down in the four quadrants of the, of the, the thing? And in that, are you going to keep the probe vertically or slantingly or going to accept in the convenient position at the end where you get a good packet? It should not be there. As such, you should have to get your packet as near the midline as possible and get the best packet perpendicular to the floor. And all these things are found to be incorrect ways of doing the ultrasound. Do, does a patient have any symptoms? No symptoms. She doesn't say I have anything. Except she may say that she is prone for hypertension when she gives a family of hypertension or she is taking some drugs. And in severe cases, she may say that she is feeling less fetal movements also. On your part, you will find the uterus is small, the uterus is full of fetus, and there may be also malpresentations and growth restrictions also. Now, we said AFI and deep pocket. At first trimester, oligos, oligos, uh, this thing, hydramnias, are we not diagnosing? Where is MPV and uh, AFI? What is the role there? In this finding, do we have a role for AFI and MPV? No. Here the CRL is 12 ml and the sac is around 14, 15 mm. The difference is less than five millimeter. So in the first trimester up to the 12 to 13 weeks, it is the sac versus the fetus occupying space, which is a uh, very uh, deep indicator of severe oligohydramnias and it is a forewarning of a gross anomaly. In all single gestations, you can only look at it after 20 weeks, two to eight, and in twins, you reduce it down to 2.2 to 7.5 as a normal value. Now, this is a picture which I took. There is a maximum vertical packet. Do we say it is normal? No. This is a patient in which severe oligohydramnias has been diagnosed and she has been given an amnio infusion and see that after amnio infusion, how you see that. So, even if you see a vertical packet, if supposing it is not horizontally good, that is not a good packet also. Now, twin to twin transfusion and amniotic fluid is one thing which everybody has to know because in TTS, which is happening in uh, this thing, uh, monoamniotic uh, twins, 10% of the cases, there is one baby with polyhydramnias, there is another baby with oligohydramnias. So, myself and Murlinger Pai have to contact this thing fight with each other, I am the first, you are the first. Both of them are bad. The oligohydramnes baby is also bad. The polyhydramnes baby is also bad because that is also not growing too well and it is going to have all the problems and have the kaidesing. So in twins, diagnosis of the 
Polyga heteramnias and poly has to be done very clearly. The recent article, which is dated 2022 January, if you go through it, you will get everything about oligo heteramnias. What are the obstetric findings in cases where you have made a small packet of liquor? Yes, low amniotic fluid, low maternal weight gain. Patient will have some abdominal discomfort. She will have a drop in the fetal heart rate. Slowly, she will feel the movements coming down and abnormal findings on a fetal monitor and fetal death finally. Now, can I do MRI in cases where I diagnose oligohydramnias? MRI as such may complement but doesn't replace ultrasonography. It may be done in cases of obesity and it may not give a better field than what we have as an ultrasound. It has a very limited resource and may be done in severe cases, especially for medical legal purposes. Have you heard about amniotic wrinkle hiding oligos in twins? Yes, this is one thing everybody has to know because the amniotic band is getting folded and it may give rise to problems in the diagnosis. So one has to document the cut in between the two babies very clearly with the amniotic sheath. Now, so we know very well that in the first trimester, the correlation is very bad, but we don't have markers. In the second trimester, we have correlation, we have markers, and we have to be very careful in looking at the renal disorders and obstructive lesions in the urinary tract. And in third trimester, it is not the anomalies, it is the maternal problems. You have to think of in-depth toxemias of pregnancy, problems you are going to face in labor, neonatal problems, and in decision-making, it is a big dilemma for the obstetrician, and it is the one which causes distress to the obstetricians also. How are you going to manage? So we find out the etiology according to the gestational age and severity, and the fetal well-being status we have to manage. There are a few people who are giving intravenous hydration. I don't have scientific evidence. Amnio infusion, which I don't know much about it. But I always look into biophysical profile and look at how I am going to manage. So this is a slide which gives in depth. We have said any AFI, which is above eight is quite no, above five is normal. And any biophysical profile, which you make it out, above eight is all right. So the good biophysical profile with normal AFA, no problem. If supposing good biophysical profile with oligohydramnias, you have to think that the baby is chronically compensated and you have to do a quite a good amount of serial testing because there is a chance of fetal death 20 to 30 per thousand. And if the AFA is going to be normal with a biophysical profile of six, know that she can go for any acute problem of the baby and you have to look at it carefully. And you have biophysical profile less. You also have oligohydramnias. That means already the baby is slowly getting damaged. There is something which is jumping onto the baby now with acute problem. And we may require, because they can go in for above 50% fetal death, and you may require daily testing. If you are having a they sing biophysical profile of just four down, and you have a, either a normal AFI or a oligos, it doesn't mean, it doesn't matter anything. And we have to deliver these babies, which are, if they are about 26 weeks, because we now have a better ex utero, uh, they sing atmosphere than in utero atmosphere. This is one slide, which I think is a therapy, which has to be, everybody has to keep it so that you avoid medical legal problems. So the management comes to be patient is admitted, ultrasound, Renal agenesis, if not present, placental functions to be seen. And to prevent any compression deformities and hypolung disease, you may think of amnio infusion with saline or ringer lactate and induce labor as and when you think it is indicated. Amnio infusion, these are the diagnostic prophylactic therapeutic ones. It decreases mainly card compression, dilutes the meconium if it is already there. So treatment is according to the cause. If the patient is on any drug which has reduced the liquor, please remove that drug and look for PROM induction. If she has got PPROM, give antibiotic steroids and then it. Rarely a fetal surgeries may be done like vesicoamniotic shunt or laser photocoagulation in cases of TTTAs. 
So follow up will be once a week in oligohydramnios, twice a week in appropriate cases, most frequent and more frequent in unstable maternal and fetal conditions. Now come to my last part of this slide, oligohydramnios and medical malpractice. Failure to obtain a thorough history. Failure to record proper monitoring of the mother and baby. Failure to prevent conditions that can cause oligohydramnia. Failure to follow standard care of timely delivery. Failure to obtain adequate informed consent from the patient and the relatives. Because the judge looks at the financial and mental burden when she delivers a congenitally abnormal child and puts it in the court and the court will always be in her favor. So in all these cases of the handling of oligohydramnias, one should have the expert opinion to be with them and do the best so that they can have the best of their life as a smooth obstetrician and gynecologist. Thank you very much for your patience here. Thank you, madam, for such a elaborate, such a detail and such a vast subject. You have made it comprehensive. And what should I say? We are really obliged and Thank you. give knowledge and updates. Everybody is enriched today. I am pretty sure about it. Thank what you. Thank you for your remarks. Yes, chairperson, give your remarks. Please unmute. Parsha has given a remark that it's... No, 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 madam, the chairperson are very important. Yeah, they have to give, they have to come up, they have to come. Yeah. 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 Dr. Anjali Vare. Right. Anjali, come forward. Yeah, yeah. Madam, it was an right. excellent talk. There is, um, you have cleared everything and basically the last diagram, uh, last picture which you have shown that... Uh, Telling about the biophysical profile and uh, correlation with the oligodramnias and action to be taken. It was uh, really very much useful for all of us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Before the start of second lecture, let me announce one thing uh, that International Academic Exchange Committee of Foxy, every webinar, fortnightly webinar, we have conducted with a, one international faculty. This webinar we have taken only the stalwarts from Foxy because I thought the amniotic fluid should be covered by our own Foxy leaders who can give it more uh, in updates. And we have a second webinar on 7th of uh, September, immediately after one week, which, which will uh, include one for international faculty and also it is on uh, research, international research. So far, Madam, we are taking uh, doing this, uh, the, um, bringing in uh, international faculty who tells us about uh, education abroad for medical uh, students, what uh, post graduation, uh, what degrees, what they can do, where they can approach, and how they should do everything. We are, we are covering in uh, fortnightly webinars. Thank you, thank you, Madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Moses. Hello? Yes. Yeah, we can hear. We move, yes, ma'am. We move forward to the next session, that is polyhydramnios. Uh, it is a pride privilege to introduce the chairpersons for this session, Dr. Anjali Ware, madam. Can we have her seat, please? She is uh, presently the professor at Government Medical College, Aurangabad, and she is also the president of Aurangabad OBGY Society. Uh, I think, uh, uh, excuse me. Dr. Uh, Sureka Taide was supposed to give her lecture because she has some... Yeah, to... I thought uh, Sureka wanted to speak now soon after. I don't yes. mind speaking after her. If, if you don't mind, sir, because I you are... Mind at all. I told her. That's why I was yeah. surprised. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, uh, can we have the slide for the third session, sir, please? Yeah, the, the session number four is amniotic fluid embolism. We have chairpersons Dr. Priya Kadam Madam and Dr. Vaishali Bhatal for this session. Dr. Priya Kadam Madam is the president of Aflus Obstetric and Gynecological Society in the, uh, in the last year. She is also the chairman at the Women's Wing IMA Aflus for the year 21 22, and she is the director of Yasoda Hospital since the last 11 years. We welcome you, ma'am. Can I have the next CV, please? Dr. Vaishali Dadal Madam is the president of Latur OBGY Society. She's practicing OBGY since the last 20 years. She has been the past treasurer and secretary of the Latur OBGY Society. And she has conducted various ubectomy camps at THC. 
we welcome both of you ma'am to chair the session can you please take the session forward uh, thank you monica for introducing me i thank iic committee and dr varsha baste madam for in, uh, for involving me in this webinar i would take this privilege to introduce academically excellent dr surekha taide ma'am dr surekha taide ma'am uh, she is a professor unique head jnmc savangi varda teacher trainer guide mentor since 20 years she is a chairperson elect foxy clinical research committee west zone coordinator practical obstetrics committee foxy member education committee indian menopause society she is the chairperson global women's health task force network tufh uh, usa core faculty dhira project and foxy founding member and vice chair women and health together for the future south africa national mentor quality improvement laksha program goi qi program master trainer emergency obstetrics thank you priya Center. can we make it brief <laughs> yes ma'am uh, she has many publications and uh, many projects at her name chapters uh, about eight chapters in uh, book then uh, many books uh, publications like uh, about three then past president and secretary at sevagram obgy society uh, she is work in com uh, community on violence against women Uh, member board of studies PIMS S D U Pravera and M U H S Nashik. Uh, she has been awarded Savitri Bai Phule Award and uh, winner of uh, Dr Anand Jivni Award. Thank you. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr Priya. Uh, may I uh, be allowed to share the screen, please? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. So is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. At the outset I would like to thank first of all Dr. Murlinhar Pai sir for allowing me to speak yes. uh, before him uh, because I have some meeting. Thank you very much sir. And uh, uh, I would also like to thank express my gratitude to Dr. Varsha Baste my friend and mentor from International Academic Exchange Committee. uh my greetings to uh, the guests um, the chief guests and guests of honor for their inspiring words and all the conveners and coordinators who have worked hard to make this a uh, grand success i would also like to thank all the presidents and secretaries who have joined here and voted for me to uh, uh, be the chairperson elect for the foxy Uh, clinical research committee thank you very much for inviting me for this very important talk which is on amniotic fluid embolism the management and of course i was listening to dr jm kanan ma'am's lecture and it was really uh, revisiting the whole thing again so i loved your lecture very much jm ma'am so uh, this is about uh, the amniotic fluid embolism and uh, my greetings from my medical college which is jawaharlal nehru medical college at wadhaka so i begin this talk with a case scenario uh, uh, let us look into it a primary gravida 23 year old came to the outpatient at 10:30 am with 36 weeks of gestation and she was having she was a known case of pre eclampsia she came with pain in abdomen she was on tablet labetrolol 100 mg since one month she was having albumin 3 plus positive with the diagnosis of primary gravida 37 weeks of gestation with severe pre eclampsia and in late in phase of labor she was given a mag magnesium sulfate and the same day at 6:30 pm she had spontaneous rupture of membrane when she was shifted to the labor room the liquor was clear 3 cm dilated now within the next uh, 30 to 45 minute patient that is at 7:15 pm she had continuous bouts of vigorous coughing her pulse pulse rate was risen to 117 beats per minute saturation was 90% on room room temperature uh, room air oxygen was connected and we saw that there was further fall in saturation from 84% to 77 to 68 so the saturation kept on falling though uh, the oxygen was increased you know to 15 liter per minute 
Now here, 7.35 p.m., patient is now shifted to the surgical intensive care unit. Physician anesthetists are called urgently in view of falling saturation and gasping state, tachycardia. Patient is intubated, you know, and put on mechanical ventilation. Patient's relatives explained about condition from time to time. High-risk consent taken. 7.45 p.m., she has a cardiorespiratory arrest. She, the, she's pulseless, BP not recordable. Now, resuscitation started immediately and continued for 45 minutes. Even after all resuscitative measures, patient could not be revived. Now, this is a case, you know, which we have to discuss went wrong. Was it preventable or not? What was the condition which affected the patient? Now, this is a the scenario which can occur in a patient of amniotic fluid embolism. What is an amniotic fluid embolism? It is a rare catastrophic event that involves the initiation of a cytochrome storm like as a result of exposure to an unknown antigen which is related to the amniotic fluid contents, typically occurs during labor or delivery. Prompt recognition is required for rapid initiation of therapies which can be potentially life-saving if appropriately madam i think surekha madam has some network issues i know is it training there <laughs> Ah, I think madam will join back. Let us see. Otherwise, we will have to take Dr. Mulidai Paisar's uh, talk. Hi, Manisha. Um, uh, for, uh, Monica, will you please call Dr. Surekha Taide? What has happened? Is she, is she be able to join? Otherwise, we will take her uh, talk afterwards. Monica? Yes, ma'am, I'm calling. Yeah. Yes, I'm calling on now. Yeah. Amniotic fluid. Dear friends, it is so important to discuss about it. And uh, every time something new comes with the updates, whether we can do amnio infusion, whether we can do amnio reduction. Everybody is confused and people want to know more updates about how to handle such cases because we always, nowadays, we come across always Irish patient in our obstetrics and, and the natal also. We have to monitor them. Fluid kitna hai, fluid jada hai, kam hai. That depends our uh, the antenatal um, care and for the treatment also depends. It's very, very important um, uh, issue about amniotic fluids. That's why we have kept this webinar as everything about amniotic fluid and none other than Dr. Surekha Taide who was who will justify this amniotic fluid embolism which is very dreaded and um, nightmare for us and for the patients also. Yes, Monica? Her number is also not reachable right now. Okay. Then what I will suggest we should uh, continue Dr. Mulidhar Pais. Uh, we should invite Dr. Sure, Mulidhar. Sure, ma'am. Uh, we should continue and let Surekha Taide uh, give her talk afterwards only because we cannot keep the dean of uh, city Dr. Murli by for waiting for so long. Sure. Thank you. Yes, uh, can we have the CD of the chairpersons of SIRS next, please? No problem at all, Dr. Varsha. Uh, Thank you, sir. And we are really no. obliged. The love, no. affection, and respect that you shower on International Academic Actions Committee is really evident. Thank you, sir, for having you yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Chairperson, uh, we've already introduced Dr. Anjali Vare Vadim because uh, she is the president of Aurangabad Obijwai Society. And we also welcome Dr. Rajendra Shava and sir. She's, he is the president of Fox Palgar Society at present and he is the secretary of IMA Boyser branch. We welcome both of you to share this session. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, uh, friends. Uh, respected Dr. Pardesi, sir. 
then uh, Dr. Varsha, ma'am, Dr. Tang, sir, Dr. Gupte, sir. First of all, I am thankful to the organizer for giving me this opportunity to uh, chair this session. Uh, for this talk that is on polyhydramnias, we are having uh, with us the renowned speaker, Professor Dr. Murli Dhar Pai. He is a Dean of Sikkim Manipal Institute of Medical Sciences and Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology. He is Professor and HOD uh, in KMC Manipal uh, from 2016 to 21. He is a founder and current chairman of Karnataka College of uh, Obstetric and Gynecologists. Uh, he, uh, on his name, there are uh, 682 guest lectures, 201 publications, 13 best teacher and teaching material and uh, awards. He is an author of Holland and Brew Obstetrics 4th edition. And also he is having 36 years of teaching and 30 years of experience as examiner for MBBS, MS and MCH. I welcome you, sir. Please. Thank you, Dr. Anjali. And uh, thank Dr. Varsha. Uh, in the last webinar, I could not log in at all. Yeah, I know, this, sir. This <laughs> I am able to log in. So you have promptly uh, called me for this. Uh, and thanks a lot for that. So thank I will, uh, yeah, yeah, I will share my. Um, yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Yeah. All right. We can see your university behind you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I welcome all of you to this wonderful place um, of Sikkim, and I really hope that you will all make it. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm exactly at the opposite end of what Dr. Jayam said. That is polyhydramnias. There's a thinking that Hydramnias means there is something wrong with the baby. Polyhydramnias means something wrong with the mother. It's a myth. Polyhydramnias also can represent the problem with the baby. Of course, there is maternal problem as well in both. If it is oligohydramnias, maternal contribution in the form of preeclampsia, hypertension, renal disease. Whereas, as far as polyhydramnias is concerned, maternal contribution is through diabetes and other diseases. So let us look into this and I'll try to make it as simple as possible. As far as the definition, all of us know polyhydramnias means excessive volume of amniotic fluid. But what is excessive has to be defined. If you go clinically, simple symphysiofundal height, which is more than three centimeters for its gestational age. But then this can be erroneous due to the maternal abdominal fat or the differences in the measurements. So ultrasound is often used to diagnose polyhydramnias. And there are two methods, as Dr. Jaim was telling. One is amniotic fluid index. And if it is equal to or more than 24 centimeters, you diagnose polyhydramnias. If you go by single deep pocket or single vertical pocket, whatever you call it, and if it is equal to or more than 8 centimeters, it's called polyhydramnias. So... What is the incidence? Generally speaking, it's not very high. It is 1% to 2% only, thankfully. But the reported rates are highly influenced by, number one, gestational age. If you did that in preterm situation, obviously, you will diagnose more of polyhydramnias. But if you did AFI in the post-term situation, the polyhydramnias incidence is very, very low. It also depends upon the population you studied, whether you studied a low risk population or a high risk population, whether the screening was done or it was an indicated ultrasound, whether it is an antepartum or intrapartum. Obviously, antepartum it will be more, intrapartum it will be less if the membranes have ruptured. What is interesting to note here, the technical way also matters. The diagnostic criteria, if you used SDP as the diagnostic criteria, it will differ. If you used AFI as the diagnostic criteria, it differs. How does it differ? Let us see. If you use SDP as the criteria, SDP tends to over-diagnose polyhydramnia because you are measuring a single pocket and if it is by chance more than eight, you say that it is polyhydramnous. For all you know, 
it may be one odd pocket which was more than 8 cm otherwise there is really not much of polyhedroneus so that's why you have to go for both the methods maybe whenever there is doubt because afi over diagnose oligohedroneus when you take four different pockets vertical pockets you may get less fluid but a single pocket may be adequate so you have to know this fact before you brand anybody as oligohedroneus or polyhedroneus what is the pathogenesis dr jam kannan has beautifully told the dynamics of the fluid obviously it is the production versus the clearance amniotic fluid volume reflects the balance between the fluid production and the movement of fluid out of the amniotic sac most common mechanisms there is decreased fetal swallowing so if there is any problem with the fetus whether neurological problem or structural problem which i am going to elaborate little later there will be imbalance in the fluid around it or if there is increased urination well oligohedroneus would be decreased urination here it will be increased urination so either the clearance of the fluid or the production of the fluid if it is not balanced properly you will get either oligohedroneus or polyhedroneus then there is homeostatic mechanism wherein intramembranous absorption happens that means the transfer of amniotic fluid across the amnion into the fetal circulation this works to maintain amniotic fluid volume in addition to the other two mechanisms which i mentioned more successful in preventing poly rather than oligohedroneus so oligohedroneus has a different mechanism altogether whereas this homeostatic mechanism prevents polyhedroneus if it is broken down then you will have polyhedroneus what are the conditions that are associated with polyhedroneus like in any other disease 40% of the time it is idiopathic but that is only antenatally after the baby is born you will be able to diagnose some abnormality at least in 25% of this 40% that is in 10 babies out of 100 you will find something which you earlier thought was idiopathic then i was talking about the major fetal structural anomaly that impedes swallowing 30% of the singleton pregnancies will have this problem why am stressing on singleton pregnancy because in multiple pregnancy it is not uncommon to have polyhedroneus especially if it is monochorionic twins all of us are aware of this the famous tttts syndrome so i am not going to go there i am talking about the singleton pregnancies now primary gastrointestinal obstruction for example esophageal or duodenal atresia will hamper obviously the swallowing secondary ga obstructions could be congenital diaphragmatic hernia and cervical or thoracic mass this there is there is nothing wrong with the gi here but because there is compression on the gi or esophagus or any other intestine from outside that also will hamper the swallowing then it could be craniofacial abnormality cleft palate cleft lip facial tumors example oropharyngeal teratoma or macrogra microgranthia all these things will hamper the swallowing part so if the baby cannot swallow the fluid is not clear fetal neuromuscular disorders also it's not just the gi the swallowing signals after all come from the brain so if there is a neuromuscular disorder that impedes swallowing for example myotonic dystrophy anencephaly of course nowadays we don't see anencephaly beyond first trimester maybe because we go for termination of pregnancy genetic syndromes this is very very interesting whenever we have congenital anomalies we think that there is fgr and if you are usually people correlate with oligohedroneus but here is a situation where there is a congenital anomaly 
which is genetic in nature, yet there can be hydramnias. For aneuploidies, I'm going to elaborate on this. So just now I'm not going to talk about much. Then prader willi syndrome, Barter syndrome, beckwith weedman syndrome, and RA sopathy, that is Noonan syndromes, cardio cutaneous syndrome, so many syndromes are associated with polyhydramnias. Then I talk about high fetal cardiac output state. Obviously, the high cardiac output is going to increase the renal perfusion and that's going to increase the urination of the baby. So what are these situations? Supraventricular tachycardia, severe anemia, maybe due to all immunization, or viral infection like parvovirus, cytomegalovirus, or it could be simply hemoglobinopathy. Fetal or placental mass with arteriovenous shunts. This is the main mechanism in case of monochorionic twins, wherein there will be a oligopoly sequence. Sacrococcygeal teratoma, for example, or large craniopharyngiomas in patients where it is singleton. Yes, here comes the twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome, which is one of the most notorious causes of polyhydramnias, along with the oligohydramnias in the other baby. Maternal diabetes. In fact, the first thing that comes to even an undergraduate's mind whenever there is polyhydramnias is diabetes, especially if there is macrosomia. That means it is an uncontrolled diabetes. Polyhydramnias and macrosomias are the clinical signs of uncontrolled diabetes. 8 to 22% of the cases, diabetes is responsible for polyhydramnias. Then, of course, hydrops vitalis. There is a 40 minutes lecture on hydrops vitalis, so I'm not going to talk about it. In other words, the causes of hydrophytalis also cause polyhydramnias. Let us look a little more elaborately what is the connection between diabetes and polyhydramnias. The rate actually varied by the type of diabetes. This is very interesting. If it is GDMA1 type where the fasting is less than 105, the incidence is very less, 5.4%. But if it is A2 type where the fasting is more than 105, it is 13.4%. Also, it differs with whether it is type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Type 1, it is 21.2%, the maximum. Whereas if it is type 2, 15.3%. All of these were higher when diagnosed by STP. I told you right in the beginning, if STP is your technique, there's a tendency to overdiagnose polyhydramnios. Fetal hyperglycemia-induced polyuria, that is osmotic diuresis, is the most likely etiology. We all know that. The first symptom of even adult diabetes is polyuria, polydipsia. So probably here, there is free supply of uh, sugars from the mother, and that's why there is polyuria in the fetus, which will contribute to polyhydramnias. Polyhydramnias is often associated with high HbA1c levels and fetal macrosomia. This is giving a support or proof to the theory. There is decreased fetal swallowing or imbalance in water movement between the maternal and fetal compartments in diabetic pregnancies in addition to the polyuria theory. So there is somehow decreased swallowing and imbalance may be related to yeah. neuromuscular yeah. problems. Yes. Okay. Then let us see aneuploidies and polyhydramnias. What is the connection? I promise to elaborate on this. Actually speaking, it is uncommon cause of polyhydramnias. Whenever there is aneuploidies, we usually see uh, other problems, FGRs and things like that. But there can be polyhydramnias. How? The combination of FGR and polyhydramnias is suggestive of trisomy 18 or Edwards syndrome. It may be because of excessive amniotic fluid that is because of difficulty in swallowing or to intestinal abnormalities associated with Edwards syndrome. Similarly, the other aneuploidy, the most famous or infamous, trisomy 21, that is Down syndrome, it may be related to duodenal atresia that is present in Down syndrome. 
What are the clinical symptoms? Of course, it is no brainer. There is increase in amniotic fluid volume, usually uh, giving rise to shortness of breath, uterine irritability, contractions, and abdominal discomfort that can occur with severe uterine distension. Symptoms may be related to mechanical factors from a very large uterus compressing on maybe the diaphragm and high amniotic fluid pressure. The classification by all three, that is ACOG, American College of Radio Radiologists and Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, they are unified in the classification, mild, moderate, and severe. If you go by SDP, single deepest pocket, eight, to 11.9 is mild. If you go by amniotic fluid index, 24 to 29.9. The moment it is 12 and more, 12 to 16, I would say, or if it is AFI 30 to 35, it is moderate. When it is more than 16, so almost double. See, we started with eight and here it is 16. So it is severe. Whereas here we started with 24, or you can consider it as 25 to easy remembrance. Here it comes to 35, it is severe. Why is it important to classify? It is important to classify to take decisions, obstetric decisions, which I'm going to elaborate a little later. What is very, very important is not diagnosing oligohydramnias or polyhydramnias. What is important? What do you do post diagnostic? Post-diagnostic evaluation is extremely important to know the cause of oligodramnias, to know the cause of polyhydramnias, that will determine our further management. So for non-hydropic singletons and dichorionic twins, you must take a detailed medical history to evaluate for heritable diseases associated with polyhydramnias, such as maybe alpha thalassemia, uh, inborn errors of metabolism in the fetus or G6PD deficiency, which can give rise to fetal anemia. And that's why there can be problems. You must evaluate for fetal head drops, even though the heading says for non-hydropic singletons and dichoronic twins, every single patient you have to rule out fetal head drops. It could be non-immune, a big list is there, or it could be immune like RH isoimmunization. We must evaluate for fetal anomalies. Just now we heard in Edwards syndrome, there can be problems with the, the swallowing. And in Down syndrome, there is duodenal atresia, which is giving rise to polyhydramnias. So it's not that only in oligohydramnias you will look for fetal anomalies. You have to look for fetal anomalies in polyhydramnias also. 80% of anomalous infants were detected prenatally. Anomalies most often missed included esophageal atresia with a tracheoesophageal fistula, cardiac septal defects, and cleft palate. One must carefully look for all these things. You must measure MCA PSV. This will definitely give an idea about the fetal anemia. And we have just understood fetal anemia is one of the causes of polyhydramnias. The MOM more than 1.5. You must work up for immune and non-immune causes. Maybe there is a RHI immunization or other list of causes. Offer genetic counseling and fetal genetic studies. You can also do a amniocentesis for fetal microarray in pregnancies with a congenital anomaly or severe polyhydramnias. Screen for maternal diabetes. Of course, it goes without saying. And finally, the question about torch. Many people are having this as one of their investigations. Most of them like this. Somehow, I don't like this. We have given it up in RPL. We have given it up in most of the situations. Here also, there is, it is unlikely to cause isolated polyhydramnias, and we do not screen for it. What is the outcome of all this? Many cases resolve spontaneously if they are mild. So you don't have to worry much unless you see an obvious cause. However, polyhydramnias has been associated with an increased risk of several adverse outcomes in addition to poor outcomes related to the associated phytomorphologic abnormalities. What are they? Maternal respiratory compromise, free labor okay. of membranes, okay. labor of birth, malposition, macrosomia, 
umbilical cord prolapse. All these things will increase the risk for cesarean birth and admission to NICU. So it is like a force multiplier. Mother has problems and that will also give rise to problems to the fetus through maybe a cesarean birth or admission to NICU. What are the prognosis? As we just understood, there is a chance of PPROM, which can lead to preterm labor and preterm birth. Preterm birth in affected pregnancies also may be caused by iatrogenic interventions. You may be doing amnio reduction. That itself may trigger preterm labor. So that is the problem. The overall risk for fetal death and unital death is to be increased. What are the causes or what is the risk of death? The relative risk increases with increasing severity of polyhydramnios. And the absolute risk depends upon the etiology. That is, whether there is a combination of FGR and polyhydramnios that has a poor prognosis. That means there is a problem with the fetus itself. Idiopathic polyhydramnios is associated with an increased risk of neonatal morbidity at term, especially neonatal respiratory morbidity. These and other adverse sequelae are likely related to underlying etiologies such as malformations, genetic syndromes which are narrated, and neurologic disorders that were not identified before birth. So we simply said it is idiopathic, but after birth we may diagnose all these things. I told you in the right in the beginning, 10% of the cases you can diagnose the cause of polyhydramnios only after the child is born. I'll come to the last leg of my talk. It is not enough to know that there is polyhydramnios and what caused the polyhydramnios. Somehow we have to manage both the pregnancy as well as the labor and try to give a healthy baby and a healthy mother. In singleton pregnancies, polyhydramnios with the identifiable etiology, let's say, for example, you can diagnose diabetes, you diagnose some other problems, the specific underlying etiology should guide antepartum fetal and maternal surveillance, intrapartum management and timing of birth. For example, again, I'll give you diabetes. Suppose you know that diabetes is causing polyhydramnios. Probably it's an easier one to manage antenatally and you can plan the delivery and you can manage the rest of it. For patients with severe symptomatic polyhydramnios, management of maternal symptoms is similar to that of patients with idiopathic. I'm going to talk about that. So if there is idiopathic polyhydramnios, it depends upon gestational age, severity, and pressure symptoms. For all patients, however, antenatal fetal monitoring is a must. And what do you mean by that? For mild to moderate cases, which is, which is uh, our amniotic fluid index, which I explained, BPP upon diagnosis, which should include an ST, and then every one to two weeks until 37 weeks, and thereafter every week. Whereas if it is severe polyhydramnios, BPP every week, right from the day you diagnose until you deliver. Maybe sometimes towards the end, twice a week or every day. In an asymptomatic, non-severe polyhydramnios, intervention to reduce amniotic fluid is not indicated. Yes, it is just at the starting point. As if a uh, single deep pocket is 8 centimeters, and AFS is 24. You look at the trend whether it is increasing or not. If it is not increasing, if the mother is not having any problem, better not to interfere at all. As pregnancy outcome may not be adversely affected, and there are no interventions that improve pregnancy outcome. Just leave her alone. Whereas if it is severe polyhydramnios, you go with this algorithm. Does the patient meet criteria for amnio reduction? Which means patient has severe shortness of breath and or, or severe abdominal discomfort with or without uterine irritability. This will definitely call for amnio reduction. So what will you do? Perform amnio reduction, that is decompression or amniocentesis, Administer a course of beta-methasone because she may get into labor, preterm labor, 
per standard guidelines and treat uterine irritability if it is present maybe indomethacin is the choice i'm going to talk about it if adequate resolution of symptoms happen manage expectantly okay now if she doesn't have any proper indication for amniotic reduction ask the question does the patient have preterm labor now let's move on to yes this question does the patient have preterm labor if the answer is yes you manage like management of a preterm labor maybe tocolytics because she doesn't require amniotic reduction it is not so bad but she has got into labor but if she doesn't have preterm labor just expectant management no amniotic reduction let's go back to the other side if adequate resolution of symptoms happened we said manage expectantly but if there is refractory severe symptoms the symptoms did not resolve even after amniotic reduction look at the gestation age if it is less than 34 weeks you may repeat amniotic reduction because you are not ready to deliver her and for gestation age less than 32 weeks only consider 48 hours of endomethazine tocolytic and you may also consider steroids and maybe even neuroprophylaxis now more than 34 weeks what are you waiting for discuss the options of preterm delivery for relief of symptoms after 34 weeks most of the hospitals now can manage the baby i'll just have couple of slides on amniotic reduction there is no consensus about how much amniotic fluid to be removed and how rapidly it should be removed and whether to use tocolytics and antibiotics or not a reasonable approach or guideline may be no more than 2 to 2.5 liters at one time and no faster than 1000 ml over 20 minutes else you may have abruption although rates of 100 to 125 ml minute have been reported you may initiate indomethacin in patients with contractions especially if it is less than 32 weeks what are the complications of amniotic reduction most common being pprom ptl ptb and less common being abruption intraamniotic infection and hypoproteinemia how do you follow up monitor afv every 1 to 3 weeks you may have to repeat the procedure sometimes two at least one week apart a slide about indomethacin it is not recommended by society for maternal fetal medicine none of us give it as a routine tocolytic however in pregnancies less than 32 weeks of gestation with preterm labor uterine irritability a short course short course means 48 hours of indomethacin for its combined effect of tocolysis and reduction of afv also it is heart friendly whereas all other tocolytics they may just do uterine relaxation but they are not heart friendly they will not reduce amniotic fluid volume that's exactly why indomethacin is a preferred choice adverse effects are there of course the concern specially occur if you use it more than 3 days that's why we say less than 48 hours and when it is used beyond 32 weeks what is the fear the fear is premature closure of ductus arteriosus and renal impairment so it may stimulate the fetal secretion of arginine and it will reduce renal blood flow and reduce fetal urine that's why it reduces polyhydramnios but if you give too much it will hamper the baby so they may also impair production of or enhance resorption of lung fluid what is the dosage 25 mg orally four times daily and limiting treatment to pregnancies less than 32 weeks i am repeating again and again because that's the essence of teaching less than 48 hours maternal side effects are very few not a big concern at all what is the place of delivery for polyhydramnios obviously tertiary care center because you may land up with so many problems timing of delivery although there is no absolute contraindication to use oxytocin or prostaglandin these drugs should be used with caution why if the uterus contracts too much then there is a chance of amniotic fluid embolism which dr thayde is going to talk more once she is back e the timing is influenced by underlying etiology and severity mild to moderate and with normal bpps you may induce at around 39 to 40 weeks even acog says better to deliver 39 to 40 plus 6 weeks 
whereas society for maternal fetal medicine somehow says better to wait for spontaneous delivery there are pros and cons of each of them severe polyhydramnios of course there is no doubt at all offer induction at 37 plus weeks to minimize the risk of umbilical cord prolapse and or or abruption in the event of spontaneous rupture of membranes offer earlier delivery on a case to case basis when patients are between 34 and 37 weeks but have symptoms which are intolerable and have not responded to amnio reduction better to deliver both for baby sake and maternal sake how do you manage the labor spontaneous rupture of membranes can cause sudden and severe uterine decompression intrapartum abruption and cord prolapse so better to go for graded abdominal or transcervical amnio reduction using a needle lp needle of big board check fetal position frequently because you may have surprises in labor when there is polyhydramnios the the cephalic presentation may change to transverse lie and you may have to take her up for section fetal heart rate should be monitored continuously and pregnancies are at increased risk remember that especially if there are fetal abnormalities there is always a risk of increased pph because the uterus was overstretched and there can be atonicity be prepared for it thank you very much for your patient listening and i hope i dealt all the issues of the polyhydramnios thank you thank you sir for your exhaustive elaborate and so detailed uh, talk on polyhydramnios and i'm i'm certain many must have doubts are clear so over to you chair persons for your concluding remarks excellent presentation uh, dr pai and uh, lots of information we got and how to manage that uh, even i think late postpartum it may cause a, it may be the uh, reason for the pulmonary embolism also i don't know uh, yeah, experts will say but uh, one thing is that that atit atit atimati so excess of uh, fluid, uh, fluid in the uh, abnormal fluid will definitely cause some problem and you have uh, nicely presented uh, your uh, uh, talk uh, really uh, very nice Thank Thanks you. very much for that, sir. And I hand over to uh, the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for excellent talk. And as you said, FGR with polyhydramnios is the worst. Yes. Thing, uh, we see because many of the times uh, fetal anomalies are there. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Varsha, once again. thank you so much pai sir for the wonderful talk there have been so many compliments on the chat for your talk yeah so i think there's just one question i mean i've asked that whether you can use diuretics for polyhydramnios yeah see uh, diuretics may not help like iv fluids may not help iugr fgr when there is oligohydramnios giving fluids to the mother is not going to help similarly giving diuretics to the mother is not going to help the polyhydramnios you are actually worsening the situation that is what is said even in case of uh, hypertension if you give diuretics to the mother just because edema is there it is actually putting pressure on the intravascular compartment of the mother and mother will suffer so i don't think uh, that is been advised at all okay thank you so much sir Always a pleasure to listen to you. We move to the session. Can I uh, go ahead with my talk? Sorry, madam, have you joined? Doctor, yeah, yeah. Doctor Giriraj is joining. Yes, madam. Yes, yes. When you could I, not join, I had to talk. Hello. No, uh, I think uh, uh, destiny, sir. It was written in uh, that I should listen to you first, and then only my talk should go ahead. No, actually, it <laughs> so is so that's nice why I think. Yeah. Of, chat, of, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, it's just. Can happen, and you discuss the treatment. So the seniors it. should go first. That's always the unwritten rule. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor Bapaiya. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I now oblige us. We 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 have with great gratitude. We bow in front of you and your knowledge. Thank you so much. Nice presentation. so should i go ahead yes yes dr surekha taide please yeah thank you so uh, i was uh, i had a case 
which was presented in a way that yes, this was patient was in labor. So I had uh, discussed about our case, which was an amniotic fluid embolism. Patient had gone in spontaneous labor. She had respiratory symptoms and then she could not be revived. Now we had some problems in that case and that is what I want to discuss throughout that yes, once we have this amniotic fluid embolism, how do we manage it? So this embolism, amniotic fluid embolism is a catastrophic event initiated by a cytokine storm as a result of exposure to an inciting antigen related to amniotic fluid contents. Typically occurs during labor or delivery. Prompt recognition actually is very much important so that rapid initiation of the life-saving therapies can be done for to save the patient's life. Incidence is one in 20,000 to 80,000 live births. However, though it is rare, the maternal mortality is very high, almost 80% of the uh, patients having maternal mortality. And if you look at the oral maternal mortality also, five to 10% of the cases of maternal mortality can be attributed to amniotic fluid embolism. 50% of our patients will die within the first hour of onset of symptoms. Of the survivors also, 50% will develop a coagulopathy. And neonatal survival is, however, if we are prompt, then we can save the baby if we, we de uh, evacuate the uterus quickly. Now, what are the risk factors we should be looking into when we are talking of amniotic fluid embolism. The, the, the AFE, that is amniotic fluid embolism, occurs in and around labor. Usually, a multiparous woman with a large baby, a short tumultuous labor, use of uh, uterine stimulants excessively. Again, it can occur during abortion also. As Sir was talking about polyhydromnios, uh, amnio infusion, or an amniocentesis, both can be the risk factors. Caesarean section, a placenta accreta, a ruptured uterus, these are also some of the risk factors. So we have to be careful and those symptoms we have to be uh, alert about. So what are these criteria which will tell us, okay, we are having a patient of amniotic fluid embolism on our hands. So if you have a patient of sudden cardiorespiratory arrest with or without hypotension, and there is an evidence of respiratory compromise like dyspnea, sinuses, the oxygen saturation is falling below 90%, and there is an over DIC in that patient. Now, there is a scoring system of the scientific and standardization committee on DIC. So if we have that over, over DIC on the scoring system, so we, we can be fairly sure that we have a patient of amniotic fluid embolism on our hand. So what is the scoring system? Platelet count about uh, 1 lakh, so 0 point, below 1 lakh to 50,000, 1 point, and below 50,000, 2 points. A prolonged prothrombin time or INR below 25% increases to uh, 0 point, 25 to 50% increase, 1 point, more than 50% increases, 2 point. Fibrinolytic level, more than 200, 0 points, less than 200. One point. So if we score the patient, a score of more than three is compatible with over DIC. So you have a patient of arrest or hypertension, respiratory distress, and over DIC. So this coagulopathy must be detected before hemorrhage itself can account for the dilutional or shock-related consumptive coagulopathy. So these all these criteria, if they are present, fairly be we are fairly sure that we have an AFE on hand. It's a clinical onset during labor or within 30 minutes of placental delivery. Absence of fever also is one of the criteria. It's a clinical diagnosis most of the time and a presence of characteristic clinical finding and should be suspected in pregnant or recently postpartum women having a sudden cardiorespiratory collapse. Okay, so these are our findings. What's the pathophysiology behind it? Because it is because of anaphylaxis or complement activation, the amniotic fluid contents, which are the debris, it gains access to the pulmonary circulation, which causes vasoconstriction, occlusion of the pulmonary vessels, pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension, left ventricular dysfunction and failure, 
Again, there is coagulopathy leading to massive PPH of maternal collapse as well as fetal distress. So this is the pathophysiology behind um, our uh, amniotic embolism. So again, let's, let us remember there's a sudden cardiorespiratory distress, the blood pressure falls below 90, evidence of respiratory com uh, compromise, documentation of over DIC and prolonged PTT and INR. And that is all we have to look into when we are talking of the um, amniotic fluid embolism. Many a times, you know, one third of our patient will have some sort of aura also, a sense of sudden doom, chill, nausea, vomiting, anxiety. So some patient becomes agitated and anxious. And that is what occurs before the uh, cardiorespiratory uh, failure and hypoxemia and respiratory failure, which we see in our patients. You know, and they, this is followed by the hemorrhage and DIC phase um, with PPH, spontaneous bleeding from the intervention sites like IV lines. You, again, you, the, your patient will also have hematuria, sometimes GI bleeding also. So that is how the patient manifests. Now, what should be done? Uh, so management is very, very important to know. Once you have a patient of collapse on your hand, the what to do? First and foremost, we have to remember that we have to have a lot of help when we are dealing with such patients. So a multidisciplinary, a team-based approach, that is very important. So you have your maternal fetal consultant, your maternity expert, you have an anesthesia, critical care person, respiratory person, as well as your nursing. So all these forms a team. It is very much desirable that this team works in cohesion so, as, uh, so that we can stabilize the patient and avoid further deterioration of the patient. So first and foremost, we have to perform the CPR and that CPR has to be a very high quality CPR. Let's remember that it has to be a rapid CPR, forceful CPR, so 100 uh, per minute, uh, your um, chest compression, two inches depth. So I will be showing you the video also of the chest compression, but let us remember that the CPR has to be a high quality CPR. Then followed by the control of hemorrhage and reverse the coagulopathy, confirm the diagnosis. And of course, uh, if you, the, the uh, delivery of the fetus has not occurred, then you have to think of delivery and let's remember that delivery of the fetus will aid in the maternal resuscitation. So this is, this is the basic management of your uh, uh, patient with amniotic fluid embolism. Begin the basic and the advanced cardiac life support. Let us remember that those, though we are obstetrician, all of us should be very well averse verse, um, be, um, with the basic as well as the advanced cardiac life support maneuvers. So manual chest uh, compression, emergency airway management with 100% oxygenation, intubation, you should have establishment of the IV access. And of course, let us remember that there should be the manual uterine displacement to avoid the aorta comp uh, cable compression, intravenous access above the diaphragm. So your IV line above the diaphragm, that has to be established. Avoidance of alkalosis is important. And if your patient is having the refractory hypoxemia, then ECMO also may be needed in your patient. So let us remember that you need to have your resuscitation team, your anesthetist or critical team also uh, together working with you when you're uh, having your patient or such a patient of collapse on your hand with amniotic fluid embolism suspected. So what can you do for hemodynamic support? You administer crystalloids, your ringer lactate, quickly rapid administration of crystallized response also should be acutely followed once you are um, you know administrating the crystalloid look for the vital signs you may your uh, critical care person will do a bedside uag of the ivc also to look for you know what is the response to your crystalloids and you should continue the fluids you you should uh, 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 if needed you know, you have, if your patient is going into DIC, you have to uh, evoke the, uh, uh, the massive transfusion protocol also. Now, you have to administer vasopressors. 
So what is the typical vasopressor of choice? Norepinephrine, consider dobutamine also if there is cardiogenic shock. Alternatives can be like epinephrine if there is an anaphylaxis, ephedrine if it is a post anesthesia hypertension or phenylephrine if, it is if there is tachyarrhythmia. So your expert will be there with you to uh, you know, choose the vasopressor. Usually the vasopressor which is chosen is norepinephrine. Now, how to manage the hemorrhage? So you have done your labs, you, you will find, you know, the prolonged PT, the APTT, fibrin, fibrinogen levels also you will be finding with the labs. You know, once you know that the coagulopathy, uh, your uh, levels of fibrinogen, what's your INR, you know, you will start the blood transfusion, the massive transfusion protocol, the um, fresh frozen plasma. If your fibrinogen level is below 100, then you will give a cryoprecipitate to your patient. Goal is to normalize the INR and have a fibrinogen level above 100 milligram per DL. You know, if your platelet count is falling below 100, you have to give uh, 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 one or two units of what we prefer is a single donor uh, platelet. However, if there are no single donor platelets, then you can give random donor platelets also uh, to this patient. So, Tranexamic acid is also recommended as a primary management in these patients who are going to go into coagulopathy immediately after. Within half an hour also, we have seen patients of amniotic fluid embolism. After their collapse, they are going into coagulopathy. Now, this is the emergency management which we should follow. So first and foremost, we will find out does the mother respond to your uh, verbal commands, to stimulation? Is she breathing? Is she sinus? Is there a heartbeat? Uh, is there capillary filling? So what to do? So here, first of all, uh, as you can see in the picture, the wedge has to be there so that, you know, you uh, the cardiff resuscitation wedge, this is needed so that you, uh, you know, the tilt, the pressure on the IVC is taken off uh, with this resuscitation wedge. Now, the resus emergency management, too, if the patient is not breathing, but the pulse is present. So what to do? Provide oxygen, assess over the next 10 seconds, artificially ventilate the patient either with a face mask or right. you should have an early intubation in this patient so for a favorable outcome. If there is no carotid pulse, immediately proceed with ECM. You will, uh, the chest compression have to be 30 compression at the mid chest and vertical. More than four centimeter of the chest movement has to be there. 100 chest compression per minute and then give two breaths. So 30 is to two rhythm has to be there. Get an ECG done. Find out if it's arrhythmia or is asystole and accordingly manage. So if there is a ventricular fibrillation, you will do the external defibrillation, establish the IV line. And if there is asystole, you will have to provide IV adrenaline to this patient. Correct the reversible cause causes if any, you know, hypoxia, hypovolemia, uh, uh, hypothermia, these have to also be taken into consideration and the management has to be done. Now, we have to remember that uterine evacuation is important in this patient, you know, not to save the baby, to facilitate the maternal resuscitation, you have to evacuate the uterus. Even the uterine evacuation has to be done even if the baby is already dead. So that means you are evacuating the uterus to save the mother and not the baby. This is the responsibility of the most obstetrically competent person present there. So whoever is the most person in the team has to take the decision to evacuate the uterus should be done on the spot and you uh, you have to uh, uh, do a rapid evacuation so that you can facilitate further cardiac compression and resuscitation of the patient so why is it indicated that the uterus has to be the baby has to be delivered and the uterus uh, uh, you know and within uh, uh, why because maternal brain damage may start within 4 to 6 minutes what is good for the mother is usually good for the baby. You must have a most intact newborns get delivered within five minutes. Closed chest massage is less effective with time. CPR may be totally ineffective before delivery. So first of all, you have to deliver and that delivery has to be rapid and on spot. 
many reports of mother coming back to life after delivery has been there in the literature. So let us remember that we have to take the decision of evacuating early so as to uh, the aorta uh, cable compression is relieved, the venous return improves, the cardiac output improves, vent ventilation improves, and oxygen consumption reduces, and thus there is improvement in the maternal as well as the newborn survival. So this is the most important decision, though it is not an easy one. So uh, you have to ask question, has three to four minutes passed since cardiac arrest? Has the mother responded to your resuscitation? Was the resuscitation optimal? Can it be improved? If these questions you have to ask yourself and within four minutes, you should make the decision that yes, start by four minutes and deliver by five minutes. So within that period of time, if you deliver the baby, then uh, uh, the optimal uh, management and optimal uh, resuscitation and care can be uh, will offer an optimal outcome also. So you have to perform the cesarean section or you evacuate by a vertical abdominal incision, which is quickest. And of course, it can be done in the, uh, you need not shift the patient to the operation theater as you can do it on spot. And the decision has to be taken by the senior most person there who is in the team. Optimal outcome depends on immediate CPR, your advanced uh, cardiac life support, if you have given properly, early intubation, left uterine displacement, and start the cesarean section by four minutes, deliver by five minutes. You think this is unrealistic? This is because you, you haven't made up your mind that if there is a patient of collapse, you have to deliver. So if you make up your mind, proper decision is taken, then it becomes realistic and you can save the, save the mother. And most of the time you can save the baby also. So evacuation of youth is very important. I'm going to show you just uh, uh, rapidly these videos of how a, 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 a resuscitation has to be done. There is no breathing. Cavity is not palpable. Dr. Kumal, come fast. Get it. IV bone can take blood samples and start IV fluid. Yes, Dr. Neeraj, come help me in the dextro rotation. So that yes. is how quickly you ask for help. Dextro rotation is important. Okay, and now you see how the chest compressions are being given. Rani Devi, of the number. Of the sternum to two centimeters of depth at the level of nipples. Her hands are straight. On the hand. The team has already been intimidated to arrive on the spot. Doctor Ekta, call the emergency team fast. Hello doctor, are you on duty today in critical care? Okay, we have a patient here in granny casualty. She is pregnant patient. She has come in a state of collapse. She is on bed number 2 in granny casualty. We need you here urgently. Okay, okay. So patient, let's change. As you can see that Dr. Isha has already been tired of doing the chest compression and Dr. Anshul take a quick survey of the situation. She realizes that this patient will require anesthesia team reference further so she has already marked the situation and have asked the team to arrive on the spot and she has told them the location properly. She has started with the chest compression and Dr. Isha has started with the bag and mask ventilation. The bag and mask ventilation and chest compressions are to be given in the ratio of 30 is to 2. With every 15 chest compressions, one breath has to be given. Let's see how they are giving it. 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004, 1005, 1006, 1007, and so on. 1015, Dr. Isha, with 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004, 1005, 06, 17, 18, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19
diameter of the sternum up to 1 to 2 cm of depth at the level of nipples. Her hands are straight. So as they have timed the CPR, they have realized that it has been already three and a half minutes and still heartbeat has not arrived and this patient may require resuscitative restore. Dr. Pfizer, that is, she quickly arrives on the situation. Let us remember that this is important. The handle gives intraumbilical vertical incision, open up the layers of the abdomen, cut open the uterus vertically, delivers the baby, hand it over the hands over to the pediatrician. Yes. And meanwhile, she is doing the certificate of hysterectomy. CPR is never stopped. Dr. Isha then looks at the monitor and realizes. Dr. Feza, heart has come. Okay, we quickly shift the patient. So now you see that after this, uh, you know, resuscitation and a proper CPR and the delivery of the uh, the evacuation of the uterus, you will find number of times that the heart has come back. And now, next thing to remember is the management of the coagulopathy and the hemorrhage. Major maternal mortality or death is a significant risk when a cesarean delivery is performed in the presence of coagulopathy. So you have to remember about the blood and the blood product and your massive uh, transfusion protocol has to be evoked here and your impaired uh, coagulation has to be taken care. So how do you realize this persistent bleeding? There may be bleeding from your needle sites also. So you have to invoke that protocol and you have to take care of the blood and blood products or also very important. Now, what about uh, your stable patient? How do you manage them? So supportive care is important. Monitoring is important. Once the patient has delivered and stabilized, now they have to be transferred to the intensive care unit and you know uh, you have to eliminate any competent, competing etiologies and patients who are hemodynamically stable at presentation, management is again supportive and maintaining a secure airway, hemodynamic stability and providing oxygenation, prevention of bleeding, and of course, other etiology. Now, what about supporting care in general? They will require a central venous line, arterial access for frequent drawing of blood, and of course, the monitoring. Sometimes you may require a pulmonary artery catheter, so you require these patients to be managed in the intensive care and all your additional monitoring will be intensive care dependent. Follow-up care is also important every four to six uh, hours you'll have to have do, uh, do some investigation for the patient. Your labs have to be done, maintain the electrolytes, the liver function, the cardiac, uh, the, the renal function, D-dimers, prothrombin time, INR, all have to be managed. And accordingly, you will require further testing either by a CT scan or a and of course, a chest radiograph also to find out if there is a cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Many a times this patient will also land into pulmonary edema just because of your treatment of fluid you have infused in this patient. So let me just tell you a, a sort of an algorithm for your patient of amniotic fluid embolism. Look for the oxygenation, the circulation, and the coagulopathy. Ensure the ABC is performed with a multidisciplinary team. For the oxygenation, you intubate. Circulation, you have an IV excess infusion, continuous CTG, pulmonary artery catheter, and you monitor the patient with their pulse ox and your arterial blood gases. Uh, you consider your inotropes and you consider FFP, cryoprecipitate, platelet, and of course, your eutrotonics also, if the patient is going into a tonic PPH, manage accordingly. So that's how you, uh, you know, manage a patient of amniotic fluid ambulance. Certain challenges are there in our setups. Why? Most of the time, denial of the problem. And once you do not diagnose correctly, then delay in response. These are the problem. Communications errors, you do not have what staff which is prepared, uh, prepared for the catastrophic event. So lack of training and lack, lack of drills, that may be a problem. Your transfusion, uh, uh, the blood and blood products are not available. Your specialist is not available. Airway management is not uh, available or you may not have an ICU facility at hand. These are the problems which lead to poor outcome in these patients. You have to remember 
that the family has to be informed you have to give good support to the family when the mother and infant infant are gravely ill you have to keep them well informed keep, keep on communicating with the family you know and also document whatever you have communicated your consents what you have counseled all that also has to be uh, you know document so if you want to improve outcome of your patient who is collapsed who is having uh, amniotic fluid thank you thank you dr sudhakar you have to wind yes, up i'm just this is winding up this is the last slide okay, okay. this is the last yeah. slide so you have to be ready yeah. with your drills and training your staff has to be trained your emergency equipment has to be there assembled your system has to be placed you have to be forewarned you you need to you know take care of your patient who is at risk and accordingly you have to manage your patient so this is so be ready be for forewarned uh, warn review and revise that's important thank so you thank you surekha for such exhaustive talk i think every one of us should come to you for the mock drill training Yes, thank thank we do you. have a, a virtual uh, lab here, simulation lab. So if you you are all welcome to visit and get trained. Thank you, thank you for such an exhaustive and such a dreaded complication of pregnancy, um, uh, delivery. Everybody is scared of, and you have elaborated it into details. Over to you, chairperson, for your remarks, and then we will move out to the uh, talk from Dr. Giri Jawad. Yes, yeah, thank Ashwini you so much, Surekha, madam. The talk was very, very informative and we totally like this idea of having simulation labs. And I think that will definitely go a long way in training the trainees also. So now we move on to the last talk of this session by Dr. Girija, madam. And I must really thank her that despite being very busy in the OT, she still has taken out time to give this talk. I would introduce the chairpersons for the session, Dr. Anuradha Garad, madam, who is the president of the Usmanabad Society. And she's done a fellowship at Bangalore. And she runs the 21st century hospital. She was trained at the 21st century hospital at Vapi. And she is currently the president of Usmanabad OBGYN Society and director of Garad Hospital. Our second chairperson for the session is Dr. Nirupama Sakdev, madam, who is the president of Kolhapur OBJVAN Society and practicing in Kolhapur for the last 20 years. She is an honorary gynecologist at the Savitri Bai Phule Hospital as well and working with the NGO Janaswastya Dakshata Samiti. Over to you, Chairpersons, to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Girija, madam. Anuradha, madam, are you there? I think I'll only take the privilege of introducing Girija, madam. Yeah, Nothing thank you like all introducing the for joining. Lady. She yes. is the professor at the Department of OBJ and Bharti Medical College and the vice president elect I of think Foxy. You know, we'll start the talk. <laughs> okay, madam. Over to you, Girija, madam. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Girija, for coming over here in spite of your emergency schedule and um, uh, gracing this occasion and highlighting on this important topic how to monitor during ANC, the AFI. And I know none other than you will justify it. I know that. I'm so sorry that I made you trip all your schedule. And uh, I think promise is a promise. I was actually walking out of it. But uh, my dear Ashwini said, no, madam, thoda sa tari bola. And that's how I'm here, friends. It was actually an ISH, you know, intrahepatic cholestasis pregnancy. The baby's NST was not well and I had to take her emergency. So mm -hmm. I'm very quickly going to tell you about something very basic and simple is monitoring the amniotic fluid during pregnancy. We have had such wonderful talks already, mm -hmm. uh, especially by Dr. Pai and the producer, and they have already spoken about what can go wrong when things are not right. And we all know that amniotic fluid is produced largely by the fetus and most of us come into being and looking after its monitoring after the 20 weeks of gestation and the two most commonest methods used to communicate about anything related to amniotic fluid is the amniotic fluid index and the maximum vertical pocket and this adequate amounts of fluid we all know are essential for the fetal development and alterations can indicate an underlying disease process affecting the pregnancy. And therefore, AFI or amniotic fluid index or AFI assessment or amniotic fluid assessment can be an indicator of fetal well-being 
wherein ultrasound offers a rapid non-invasive way. And some methods have noted that sonographic assessment of amniotic fluid may not sometimes be accurate compared to the more direct dye dilution method. We all know it's so interventional done in the research setting. We can't do it in our everyday practice. So we have to ensure that we are doing the sonographic assessment properly. So ultrasound is known to be safe real-time option with comparable clinical outcomes, and it can be qualitative as well as semi-quantitative. And the maximum vertical pocket and the four quadrant amniotic fluid index are semi-quantitative methods with established reference ranges common in clinical practice. And this is very important that you have to measure the vertical diameter of the maximum free lagoon and you have to ensure that you know you are taking into account the placenta, the cord and everything while you're calculating it. Calculate the amniotic fluid index correctly. You can do it actually four times in four quadrants that can be four by four formula so that you do not go wrong. And it's very important to use a correct technique with the transducer held perpendicular to the flow. Incorrect would be when it is not perpendicular to the flow and may cause overestimation of the AFI and too much pressure on the transducer also may cause underestimation of AFI. And these have to be remembered. Now, amniotic fluid assessments are considered an integral part of the routine and uh, anatomic fetal evaluation with derangements often found incidentally. And we had uh, wonderful talks on oligo as well as polyhydramnia. So what is important is the ACR guidelines state that Amniotic fluid assessment should be performed at all sonographic fetal evaluations, and that's a window of opportunity. And especially specific high-risk factors in pregnancy have a potential to alter the dynamics of the amniotic fluid because of placental perfusion or break or prom and so many other things. And we all know diabetes can cause certain issues. So hypertension, fetal growth restriction, fetal anomalies, and additionally, when you find that clinically the fundal height is not corresponding to what you're expecting, you would want to look at this. Likewise, if there is a prom, you additional evaluation by amniotic, you know, the sonography can help. And additionally, is if you see when you are looking at biophysical profile, amniotic fluid index is an integral part of looking at the well being of the fetus. Now, there are certain contraindications because despite we knowing that ultrasound is safe in pregnancy, Ultrasound should only be performed when really, really medically indicated and unindicated ultrasound should be avoided. The concept of as low as reasonably achievable, the ALARA, should be applied to reduce the overall thermal index exposed to the fetus. And Doppler should not be used unless necessary due to the high energy output of this technique. So it's very important to use standard transducers, the four quadrant evaluation, the cord and the placenta into account. Now, there are many intra-observer variations also seen. Sometimes we see a patient has done a scan just maybe a few uh, days back or maybe a few hours back, and then you find that there are different readings. And this can be because of maternal dehydration to an extent. And it has been found that hydrating the mother, and therefore, while we are encouraging women are waiting for their sonography turn, it's always a good practice to encourage them to consume a lot of water especially simple hypotonic oral solutions are more effective than isotonic IV fluids. And instructing the patient to drink several of water may improve the specificity when diagnosing oligohydramnios especially. We have to also remember that, you know, sometimes unnecessary interventions and delivery decisions can be considered because of these abnormalities. And therefore, we have to be very careful when we take these calls. Now, can there be any complications during the sonographic assessment of AFI or MVP? These are definitely minimal, but patients may experience discomfort with pressure from ultrasound probe or little lightheadedness from the gravity uterus compression in the vena cava in the supine position. And you can just keep them a little tilted or maybe put a roll towel so that they are inclined and there is no direct pressure on the IVC. Now, how do you interpret normal reference ranges for the AFI vary depending on if the 5th to the 95th or the 3rd to the 97th percentiles are applied. And you should always have a standard graph there to reference it. And you can see that as per the gestational age, it would vary. For single gestations, about 20 weeks, normal fluid is noted as an AFI between 5 to 24 centimeters, although some reference prefer 25 centimeters as the upper limit. 
MVP in single gestation pregnancies is considered normal when measured to be between two to eight centimeters. And it is important to note that only MVP is used to assess the amniotic fluid volumes in multiple gestation pregnancies. And in a diamniotic pregnancy, it is measured in each amniotic sac following the clinician to, allowing the clinician to attribute fluid to each fetus. Although the normal range for twins is closer to 2.2 to 7.5 centimeters, it is conventionally defined normal as between two to eight centimeters. Now, twin to twin transfusion syndrome, though rare, is a special case which warrants mentioning in the discussion when we talk of amniotic fluid derangements. Because you can see on one side, you're dealing with oligohydramnios, while on the other, there can be polyhydramnios in the same pregnancy. And it would occur in 10 to 15% of DAMC uh, uh, twins due to shared chorionic vessels. And the diagnosis requires a single placenta and the findings of oligohydramnios in one twin and polyhydramnios in the other. So it is often associated with hydrops of the twin with polyhydramnios and growth restriction of the teen with oligo and due to significant associated maternal and fetal mortality and morbidity. So with this, current guidelines recommend screening starting at 16 weeks and continuing every two weeks until delivery to allow for early identification treatment and to guide delivery timings. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And above all, thank you, Dr. Varsha. Varsha Masta is really, really doing a lot of work actively. And I think all of us must support and encourage her in all the endeavors that she is undertaking. And also, thank you, Ashwini, for goading me, you know, to deliver this talk. Thank you so much. I hope I've been I've been able to add some value to whatever has happened till now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grija, for your excellent high standard academic we always like to uh, listen to you watch you and uh, the updates are really very very nice very high standard um, uh, deliberations thank you thank you so thank much you so what much. Do it's you always like crisp and clear madam thank yeah, you very much thank you dear persons your remarks please yeah thank you thank you it was really wonderful uh, presentation dr girija it's uh, it's our day to day uh, uh, you know the topic uh, regarding amniotic fluid once it is uh, it uh, sort of moves away from normality then suddenly the patient becomes because of oligo or polyadrenal becomes high risk and needed further and repeated re evaluation so it was really nice and uh, thank you dr varsha for making kolapur society part of this uh, uh, session and it's amniotic fluid is really wonderful topic we deal with it in day in day out and obviously pro it uh, sort of provokes so many problems in front of us till the baby is out you. i sometimes really feel like you know we should have one robo going around in the amniotic fluid and telling us details about it it's really mystery thank you for taking this topic and inviting such a wonderful faculty to elaborate dr by Dr. Uh, obviously uh, Sure Sureka and now Girija. It was wonderful, wonderful evening and uh, definitely informative sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you for your gracious presence. Thank you. I think Dr. Ashwini, we should quickly move on for panel discussion because our time is 10:30. So we can have only quick um, uh, panel discussion with quick answers from the okay. panelists is it okay yes. so please share yeah, the yeah, slides I'm absolutely fine i'll share the screen yeah uh, can you make me the host so that i'll share the screen yeah the panelists are i think panelists are just um, the panelists are there all of them are there i don't know whether they are there or not but um, now my co moderator is dr ashwini kai thank you ashwini for helping me to pre prepare this ppt also and our esteemed panelists are Dr. Manisha Ghadke, Priya Vora, Nasrim Mawani, Jaya Kore, Tulaskar, Seema Patil, Meenal Deshmukh, Sangeeta Tajpuriya, uh, and uh, all our dear friends, near and dear friends. And I'm not the... able to share my screen. Yeah, I'll share it after this. Uh, yeah. Dr. Saiti Priya, because I, I am at present at Jamshedpur. I cannot uh, do the slide share. And, yeah, yeah, madam, I am uh, sharing it. Sharing it. Yeah. I am tomorrow at Ranchi, so I could I, I have my laptop but I couldn't share it. Yeah. 
Because of really, we can meet at Ranji tomorrow. Not yes, day yes, after. Yes, I am yes, there on yes, Saturday. Yes. Okay. So welcome all our panelists. Varsha Madam, you can start. I've just uh, shared yeah, that. Oh, yeah. So I make it a uh, slide share. Yeah, I've made it slide share, Madam. Um, okay. And uh, esteemed panelists, uh, I have just read the list. Can you move it forward? Slide show, Ashwini. Slide show. Mala slide shows this way, madam. Ali Kali Bagna. No, no. Mala, eight minute. Mala slide show, madam, this way. Ata? No. No. Okay, but two more slides, then I'll move further. Okay. Ah, okay. okay. And Mala, this way. If you can help her, Saiti Priya. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so um, the first question, uh, can you move for one, one, yeah. one slide, the question? Yes, madam. What is the composition of amniotic fluid? Yes. Can anybody, Seema, can you start with your um, uh, talk? Yeah, madam, uh, actually uh, it arises in the first trimester. Uh, it constitutes only of the maternal plasma, ultrafiltrate of the maternal plasma. And later on, uh, uh, and uh, some part comes from fetal plasma and the fetal skin and cord. But uh, in uh, second and third trimester, it usually composed uh, of mainly fetal urination and the uh, exudation of, uh, from the fetal skin, from the pulmonary secretions, lung secretions, um, and the, uh, even the exudates from the uh, skin. Absolutely, okay. Good. Uh, next question, please. Uh, can you move the slide? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can Ashwini. you see it, madam? I can see the second slide. No, we cannot see. Huh? Yeah, now we can see. How does the amniotic volume increase with each trimester in pregnancy? Dr. Manisha, please, can you elaborate yes. on this? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, to okay. Both I see you <laughs> and you also, and also Ashwini. Uh, so in first trimester, it is up to only uh, 5 to 50 ml uh, as uh, the oscolarity plays an important role. But then it changes after 16 to 18 weeks, it becomes a little more significant as daily the fetal urines uh, is around uh, 7 to 14 ml adding on to the volume. And uh, this would roughly contribute to around... Uh, 500 ml at 18 weeks, then 800 ml around at uh, 34 weeks and uh, 600 ml at term. So this is how the volume uh, changes. Um, Ashwini, you can take further. Yeah. And next question. So, uh, basically, I just want to know from any of the panelists, how is this amniotic fluid volume controlled? Uh, it's next controlled. Question. You cannot see this uh, question. I don't know what is that. I can now. Uh, is it? Uh, okay. Ashwini, can I take it? it? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Ashwini, can I take the question? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure, madam. Okay. So, um, as we all have heard that the fetal urine is uh, the main contributor post uh, 20 weeks and uh, the transitation from the fetal skin also but it <coughs> has to be controlled and uh, recycled again so the gut uh, the swallowing movements they take in liquor to the extent of 350 ml per day and then it is absorbed from the gut which is returned to the fetal circulation and from thence it is returned to the maternal circulation that is one way and also the intramembranous uh, absorption as uh, one of the panelists just now enumerated, how the osmolality difference helps in the passage of the fluid from the amniotic uh, uh, sac to the baby. True. Next so question. any problem with the following, we immediately have problems with liquor. So this is how the amniotic fluid circulation takes place. I think we'll move on quickly to the basic function of the amniotic fluid during pregnancy. I mean, why are we so worried about this fluid? Uh, I can take it. Can I take it? Yeah, can I I am. But you are not seen. Can I take yeah. it? Minal, uh, Madam yeah. and Dr. So, Priya. Can I take so, Minal it? Minal is taking it. Minal take it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it provides uh, room for the growth and movement of the baby. Then uh, the pulmonary development of the fetus. Then it protects the fetus from trauma. It maintains temperature. Though it has antibacterial activity. And mainly it's function is in dilatation of the cervix. 
Wow. Nice. Okay. I will ask the question next. What is the clinical yes. importance of amniotic fluid? Priya, can you elaborate? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it is important for screening of the various congenital <coughs> malformation, then even for the diagnosing of the premature rupture of membranes, for assessing the lung maturity, and it's a very important part of the fetal well-being test. So if there is an under or over, like if there's a polyhydramnios or there's an oligohydramnios, we must suspect that there could be a congenital malformation, especially which is involved. And sometimes it just may be an idiopathic, but you need to assess and search properly for the congenital malformations in the anomaly scans. Excellent, excellent. Next up, next question, Ashwini, you take it. Yeah. So basically, when do we start assessing this amniotic fluid? And I think with the advent of this ultrasound, it's become very important and very easy for us to assess this amniotic fluid. And all this points out to various fetal anomalies. So when do we start assessing this AFI or the it's amniotic fluid? 16 to 18. 16. Mostly after 16. It's really in the second, after second trimester. Right. So what are the two most important things that we see? Uh, the AFI is first thing that we will see. And also the DVP. That is the deepest vertical <laughs> pool. Right. That's the so most these are the two most mistake. important and sensitive indicators. True. So, How do we define as oligoidermias and polyidermias? Is anybody? Yes. Uh, yes. Oligoidermias uh, shall I? Yes, yes, please. Uh, uh, in oligohydramnios, uh, it can be defined as the, the total quantity of amniotic fluid less than 200 ml, or uh, in AFI, in total of less than 5 cm of one of the deepest uh, vertical pocket mm -hmm. less than 2 ml. And polyhydramnios, yeah. we define as more than 2000 ml of amniotic fluid or uh, AFI more than 25 centimeter or the deepest uh, vertical pocket more than 8 ml. Very good. Very good. So it's very important to basically quantify the liker into ml or AFI or at least the deepest vertical pool rather than just writing slightly less, slightly more or liker appears uh, more or increased. So always better to quantify it. Yeah. So can anyone take the types of polyhydramnios? I can take it. I'm Priya. Yeah, yeah, yeah madam. Yeah. So uh, the polyhydramnios, if it's a mild, then the AFI, it is between 8 to 10 centimeter when you are seeing the single vertical pocket. And if you are doing the summation of all the four uh, in the four quadrants, and if it's more than 25 to 29, it's mild. If it's moderate, then it is 10 to 12. Or it is about 30 to 35 when you're seeing all the four quadrants. And if it's severe, it is more than 12 centimeter and more than 35. And most of the times, it is a mild, which is around 65%. Right. Excellent. So most of the time, it's always yeah. mild idiopathic types, which we come across. Madam, you want to take this? Varsha, madam? Yeah, no, no. no. Okay. okay. What, what all can lead to polyadromias? <coughs> Ma'am, can what I take the causes it? of polyhydramnios? Yes, Minel. Uh, it is uh, sometimes it is idiopathic. Then uh, it is due to diabetes. Then there may be multiple <clears throat> pregnancies. Uh, then uh, infections, uh, anomalies in the baby, and uh, sometimes uh, placental hemangiomas. Yes, absolutely. So absolutely. Is the most even even problems with the baby. Rx IC uh, immunization. Yes. Problem with the baby, as sir has already told, that uh, problem with swallowing, then uh, some congenital defects in the baby. True. Ex also, genetic causes. <laughs> Urination. Also, the birth yes. defect or anomalies can lead to these yeah. problems of yeah. so yeah. swallowing. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, um, the abnormal babies can have more of these polyhydramnios. So what is the clinically the, uh, it is the presentation of these polyhydramnios? Yes, Manisha. There, yeah, there will be pain, uh, pain in abdomen complaints all the time, many of the times. Uh, like contractions also might start earlier and give rise yeah. to preterm labor as well. And dyspnea is there, and uh, edema will be there. Yeah. Okay. Even uh, even the uh, size of uterus, height of uterus will yes, be more than uterus. the gestational age. Yes. 
it won't correspond so, yeah. so what complication there that you can, can lead with polyhydramnios priya uh, one is it could be associated with the congenital malformations patients can have preterm labor then there could be mal presentations also there could be a cord prolapse in labor and they can have a slow prolonged labor with a abruption aph or even a postpartum hemorrhage due to atony of the uterus absolutely absolutely next yes. what would be the treatment options that we have for polyhydramnios first is hospitalization of these patients is uh, very important as uh, they may land up into labor and the discomfort is very marked then uh, bed rest is advised and amnio reduction if the uh what do we say discomfort is even more dyspnea and all these kind of uh, uh, symptoms are marked then we will also advise to go for a amnio reduction in severe cases right right i think in few cases you may even use a short course of endomethacin yeah uh, we will take only one case uh, yes, let yes. us see that we will only take this Sure. Primary with thirty-eight years, um, uh, thir thirty-eight year old primary has AFI twenty-nine with no other obstetric high risk factors, normal sugars. Now wants to know the timing of the mode of delivery and mode of the delivery. She is worried about the baby and wants to know how frequently to do USG. One of you can take yeah, it. Yeah, shall I take? Yeah, yeah. Huh. Yes. Um. Uh. In this case, it appears to be uh, uh mild uh, grade oligodendrous. I think we should uh, counsel her that not to worry much. Antenatal fetal surveillance uh, may not be required in such idiopathic case because there are no other things high risk factors seen. No maternal factors or fetal factors high risk factors like anomalies or any diabetes mellitus accompany. so uh, we need not uh, induce her as such uh, or uh, she doesn't require any hospitalization at this moment and uh, she might she can go uh, into natural she can be allowed to go into natural labor also and uh, i think we can uh, take a fort nightly you uh, ultrasound for her uh, to follow is sangeeta not there sure. sangeeta tajpuria Okay, Madam, next I am, question. I am there. Yeah, you are there, na? The next yeah. question. Can Sanita? you just uh, sum okay. up in one line the importance of four quadrant AFI versus the deepest vertical pool? Uh, the DVP is uh, much better as uh, four quadrants might overdiagnose the conditions of polyhydramnios. So the right. DVP in these cases is uh, much more reliable. But whereas in uh, oligohydramnios Oligo. cases. Okay. um we should also go for afi afi rather True. than correct depending yes. on correct. so like Next. afi afi is over diagnosed by uh, it over diagnoses or uh, oligohydramnios mm -hmm. and uh, no sorry polyhydramnios and tvp uh, under diagnosis yeah, yeah kind of next question kind take uh, dr tajpuria take it next question yes ma'am Yeah. So, uh, can you just enumerate the causes of oligohydramnios in short? Yes, madam. It can be as we have seen because of polyhydramnios, the causes is anomaly. So, can be or because of oligohydramnios, causes can also be anomaly. And the uh, very common is high leak, which the patient may not uh, uh, diagnose or she can take it for granted. And suddenly, we can come to know that she is having a uh, oligohydramnios without any obvious leak. and then some associated medical disorders like hypertension or there is some intrauterine growth retardation isolated some drugs and lastly if there is no other reason then it can be idiopathic thank you thank you so what are the common are complications, the complications that we see with oligodendrons sorry should i take that yeah 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 Of, um, yes, please, please. Okay. <laughs> um, so, because of the less liker, uh, we can have limb contractures, facial deformities because the face is pressed against the uterine wall. We can have a lot of uh, hypoxia because of uh, cord compression, pulmonary hypoplasia because of uh, liquor is very important for the development of uh, the lungs. and when the three together are there with bilateral renal agenesis that is the portus <coughs> group 
and um, uh, iud growth restrictions uh, fetal distress and death will be the eventual outcome in cases of uh, oligodendrons complications yeah. okay so, uh, so this, this is, is the algorithm uh, yeah the algorithm true madam you can uh, read out this slide no okay no need of reading it uh, we know all no. right okay. so we'll uh, take the last question the treatment options for oligohydramnios yes priya we can give Any priya? Uh, oral hydration or the intravenous iv fluids can be given various studies have not shown any that iv is better than oral so i think around 2 liters in 2 hours need to be given l arginine is another drug which 3 grams a day which you can try and left lateral position uh, restricting the activities may also play a role and uh, i think uh, yeah yeah l arginine is very important rightly you have said it i think Thank all of us use it very routinely in our practice whenever we come and i think and madam if question, there is yeah. i think a pih or anything associated then you may give even ecosprin till about 34 to 36 weeks we continue that true next fine i think madam that is the end of this panel with a few take home messages i'll just quickly run through it major afi starting as early as 16 weeks and don't report it subjectively as little less or little more always suspect polyhydramnios with a four quadrant afi and oligohydramnios the deep vertical pocket measurement is very important look out for maternal disease or fetal abnormalities whenever you have an abnormal afi whether it is oligo or polyhydramnios higher the polyhydramnios higher the chances of underlying fetal abnormality and hence the need to deliver in a tertiary care unit and isolated polyhydramnios oligohydramnios in milder forms doesn't alter the obstetric outcomes or the management so thank you so much all our panelists for being with here despite being 10:30 in the night yeah thank you thank, thank you so you. much and a uh, big thank you from, from by on uh, our dr palm uh, for thanksgiving and uh, i am also thankful to all the chairperson president secretaries from various societies esteemed panelists esteemed uh, chairpersons and uh, speakers and uh, guest of honor everybody obliged dr uh, foxy international academic exchange committee with their gracious presence and spending so much of time and acknowledging your presence with valuable uh, uh, inputs uh, and there is many take home messages we have received today thank you thank you so much over to uh, dr pan um varsha ma'am can we invite all of them for the session we are having on the 7th how to present yeah yeah of course we have to this we have thank to thank you shield uh, for being our uh, academic partner there is a, there is a one session uh, for uh, international research which was uh, headed by dr priya on uh, kadam and uh, she she is the um, she, she priya shinde she is the main um, organizers along with dr surekha taide um, and we have an international faculty also they will highlight um, dr gita balsawar dr girijawar dr surekha taide they are the speakers for the next um, uh, webinar on 7th of september all of you are invited tell the other people also the, those who are doing diploma who are the students who are the uh, who are the medical uh, medical college students everybody can um, join in to know uh, what about international research what is it talked about and what are the uh, how to uh, do it the international speaker also will tell us and our other stalwarts also will tell us uh, about it thank you thank you so thank much you, over to you, dr priya thank you ma'am thank you for making us part of the panel thank you varsha thank you thank you so much ma'am thank, thank you thank you thank you so much so much again ma'am Thank, thank you, you everybody. Thank, thank you, Ashwini. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. 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 Thank